So you see me again. Um, so it's going to be a slightly different topic, although it's very much uh, related to what we, uh, the lecture that we had before. Um, so I'm going to give a sort of overview of the nuclear physics. It's kind of hard to do, right, <laughs> within one, one hour um, to give all this, but I'll, um, I'll, I'll do my best here. So overview of nuclear physics, uh, weapons technology and testing and development of nuclear weapons. And the, the way I approach this, usually when I talk about nuclear weapons, is to really talk from first principles and sort of um, talk physically about what these, what these are, what happens actually at the nuclear level. Because I think that's a good way to, to actually understand uh, the whole process. So this is just an outline. Um, actually, on the right side is, I think, a very nice um, sort of uh, painting uh, graphic of the fission process. And what this is showing um, is a neutron coming in, inducing fission, where the, the nucleus splits up, and you get neutrons coming off. So I think it's kind of a, a very nice description. You see here, the neutron comes in, and you should see here somewhere other neutrons coming out. It's kind of a nice, nice kind of picture. So we're going to be talking about this fission and what I call the nuclear difference, the difference between chemical energy and nuclear energy. Um, critical mass and nuclear weapon design. We're not going to go through too much detail, but a, a little bit. Then the difference between a gun type and an implosion uh, type uh, nuclear weapon. Then we're going to talk about fission products and uh, sources of radioactivity. I think this is the first time that I'm teaching that here because last time I didn't include it and I really realized it's so, impar so important to get a sense of the environmental impact. Um, although I'm not going to go into much detail, it's, it's something that sh should be mentioned, I think, about the past nuclear tests. Um, and then I'm going to talk about boosted and multi-stage nuclear weapons and um, a little bit more about nuclear testing, but, but um, not, not too much detail. So we start really we're starting at the beginning, using all your, all your uh, past knowledge. So basically it starts here. Um, with molecules, I'm showing this sort of graphic of the hand, right? This is because we're all made of molecules. And molecules are made up of atoms, right? This is really starting, starting basic, made up of atoms, which are basically negatively charged electron clouds with a sort of central, very hard nucleus. And the nucleus, and that's what we're going to be talking a lot about uh, in the next, next hour, is made up of protons and neutrons, right? Protons are positively charged and neutrons have no charge. Electrons are negatively charged. It sort of balances um, all the charges. And these guys themselves, these protons and neutrons, are actually made up of other little subatomic particles, which I'm not going to go into detail about quarks. So you kind of see this whole chain of different particles, right? Start with quarks, then neutrons, protons, then atoms, then molecules, then hands, humans. Okay, so th this is kind of the modern view of the, uh, of the atom, is that you have basically a very, you know, you have basically this negatively charged cloud with the central positively charged nu uh, nucleus, a hard, dense center. And the negatively charged cloud, or the atoms, is, you know, the electrons are what's, what really chemistry is all about, the electrons moving around and so on. That's how uh, bonding happens. And let's represent the energy that's involved with that as the energy chem, E and then this sort of chem there. Um, whereas the nuclear side, this already gives you how dramatic the difference is between the chemical world and the nuclear world. The nuclear world, the energy that's involved there, is more like 10 to the 6, so 1 million times the energy that's involved in chemistry. Because the chemistry is hundreds of electron volts, it's just the energy in bonding and in coal burning and all this stuff, that the, at the micro scale is 100 electron volts but in the nuclear world, you talk about MeV, or millions of electron volts. So you have this huge difference in, in energy scale between the two. And that's really, you know, atoms bonding to form molecules is chemistry, and pro protons and neutrons bounding in the nucleus is nuclear physics. And that's really the difference. And that's why this is this drastic difference in energy scales. So here I showed it in, the, in a bit more detail, and I don't really want to uh, go through this too, uh, too much. The uh, atomic binder energy basically represents the energy with which to hold an atom together. And that's hundreds of electron volts. And you see that here for um, different atomic number. Atomic number means basically the proton number, and it really tags the element. So elements are different by the number of protons that they have. So hydrogen will have one proton, helium will have two protons, and so on. So that's how you tag, that's the difference between different elements. And here you see, uh, based on the atomic number, the binding energy. 
And that's that kind of that fundamental energy scale um, that I'm talking about with chemical bonding. Right? And here we're talking about hundreds of electron volts, hundreds of electron volts. Whereas for, uh, and sorry, uh, yeah, okay, so I'm just saying that one EV is a very small unit of energy that's more relevant for atoms than it is for nucleus. So now, let's talk about the nuclear binding energy. Right, so here the average binding energy is more like MeV or millions of electron volts. It's measured in millions of electron volts. So we've done this giant leap for 100 electron volts when we're talking about chemistry. That means coal burning. That means, you know, everything that we know of um, to the nuclear world where suddenly everything is in MeV. All the nuclear reactions are in MeV. So one MeV is uh, one million electron volts. Uh, and 100 EV, I wouldn't say it's one electron volts, the energy in the world of chemistry. I would say it's about 100 EV or 13 EV is what it is for the, the bonding for a hydrogen atom. So it's very, very different scales. That's the, that's the important point. And so that's the difference between the nuclear world and the chemical world. If we think about one kilogram TNT, um, uh, uh, picture on the left, right? That's a, I'm just showing an explosion there about one kilogram TNT. And then on the right side, I'm showing one kilogram of uranium-235. How dramatic the difference is between the energy that's, that's given off in the two, two different processes. Um, it's really quite amazing. So the yield for one kilogram TNT is one kilogram TNT. But the yield for one kilogram uranium-235 is about 15 kiloton TNT. Right? So it's a huge, huge difference. So the question is how, I'm a big fan of, uh, of Korean uh, drama, and that's why I have this picture here. Uh, how do we harness this energy that's embedded in the nucleus? And I want to emphasize it's a double-edged sword, right? On the one side, we want to harness the energy because we want to use it for producing electricity uh, in a safe way, uh, with, with that caveat. And on the other side, it's been, it, it had the sort of negative side with, the, with, the, um, uh, with nuclear weapons. So it's, and, there's, all, there's also other positive sides in terms of cancer therapy and all this stuff. We're using uh, isotopes and, and, and all this. So it's very much a double-sided sword when it comes to nuclear energy, as we all learned, I think, from Fukushima too. So it's, it's kind of starting to think, where do we start? Well, let's start with uranium-235. Let's look at this very important isotope, uranium-235. <coughs> Excuse me. So elements versus isotopes. A chemical element is one type of atom distinguished by its number of protons in the nucleus. And that's what I call the atomic number. So it's basically the number of protons. Um, they combine into molecules which have specific chemical properties. Water is an example. Water is H2O, so it's two hydrogens and an oxygen uh, atom. And trinitrotoluene, or TNT, is C7H5N3O6. So they're all basically uh, mixtures of, of uh, different uh, uh, elements, which is a well-known explosive. An isotope of an element has the same number of protons of the element, but differs in the number of neutrons. So as I said, the uh, element is tagged by the number of protons. So you can talk about the isotope of hydrogen. One isotope of hydrogen is deuterium, which means it has to have, it's two, so it's two, probably. Right? So it's one proton, one neutron, so the mass is two. Right? You can have tritium, which is one proton and two neutrons. If it would be uh, helium-3, then it would be two, two protons and... Uh, or I have to be careful there. But basically, the, uh, the, the, the point is that the, uh, the proton number tags the element. Right? So that's what it means, isotopes of hydrogen compared to helium or compared to something else. Um, and the point here is that the chemical reactions can lead to small energy, but nuclear reactions are very different. It can lead to a very large amount of energy. So that's the difference. So first, let's start by making neutrons. This, um, I'm sure you've seen before, is the periodic table, and it just organizes different elements. Not isotopes, but elements. Um, and up here, there's a, a beryllium. And up there, 84, all the way down here, is another element called polonium. And polonium-210, so that's an isotope of polonium, so its total mass number, which is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons, is going to be 210. That particular isotope is called polonium-210. It has a half-life, from what we talked about before, 
of uh, 22.4 years. No, that's not correct. It's 138 days. Blowing to 10 has a half-life of 138 days. Sorry, that's a typo. It's much less. It's 138 days. The thing I wanted to emphasize is that uh, polonium-210, when it decays, it releases an alpha. And when the alpha hits beryllium, this material beryllium, you produce neutrons. Okay? So basically, you've gone from polonium decaying, producing an alpha, interacting with the beryllium, and that gives off a neutron. So you get an alpha and then a neutron. And why that's amazing is once you produce this, this is how they discovered uh, fission, the fission process in the whole, uh, the whole way that they've discovered it. When a neutron hits uranium-235, and this is what's so incredible, the uranium-235, which is 92 protons and 143 neutrons, right? the 92 protons, 93, 92 plus 143 equals 235. That's how you label these, uh, these isotopes. When it hits, the neutron hits this particular uh, nuclei, then it splits. It's almost as if, you know, um, I don't know if you, you know these lava lamps, which is an example that I like. You know, in, in lava lamps, they have this sort of this fluid thing, and it sort of goes like this, and then it sort of splits like that. Well, the uranium-235 nucleus, is, it's, it's about ready to split, and it only needs a small kick coming from a neutron to actually get it to split. Right? It's like cell division. Uh, as well, as so you see this picture here. What's amazing about this is the amount of energy that you get when it actually splits. So when a neutron comes in, and this could be even better if it's a very slow, slow-moving neutron with very little energy. If it's a very slow-moving neutron and it hits this uranium-235, then it will split, and it'll split in many different ways, but let's just assume it splits. Then it splits and gives off two neutrons, two or three neutrons, and it depends. And it also gives off gamma rays, right? And then you also have the, the fission products that are produced. That's basically, you know, what's left behind when the, two, two, when the uranium-235 splits. And if you look at the energy that's involved, it's, it's phenomenal. So the kinetic, you have to first the energy of the fission products themselves. That's 165 MeV, million of electron volts. You have the prompt gamma rays, the gamma rays that are released, that adds another 7 MeV. Then you have kinetic energy of the neutrons, so this is energy that's embedded in the, the movement of the neutrons. Um, that's another 5 MeV. And then you have the fission products themselves, which are decaying afterward, because the fission products, they decay, or so they, when, the fission, when the fission process happens, uranium-235 splits in funny ways, and these materials that are left behind, these, they're called fission products, these ones tend to be radioactive, so they'll want to decay. Right? And these will give off particles. That's why fission products are so radioactive. And that's, kind of, that's uh, what I'm going to be talking about. When you add it all up in terms of the, the prompt energy, it's something like 180 MeV. 180 million of electron volts. That's where you get this massive difference compared to the chemical world, compared to the, uh, compared to the nuclear world. So you get a lot of energy. Now here's what's so amazing. What I showed before is two, new, two neutrons, two or three neutrons, depends on the isotopes, depends on, you know, it's, it's, an issue, it's a matter of probability. Um, two neutrons going off. Now, what was so amazing is that if I changed the picture and had more uranium-235 there, so now I have one, two, three, I have, you know, many of them, then one neutron can induce fission in another uranium-235, and then that will split. When that one splits, it releases another neutron. Then that neutron will find another uranium-235, and that will split, right? So you get what's called a chain reaction happening. And this is how you get such immense amount of energy being released um, if that's done very fast. So this is, the, this is kind of a picture of what's really happening. Um, so in this case, you have uranium-235 splitting. Here I'm using mouse traps because we're going to be, uh, get, I'm going to give, show a video which is going to demonstrate this in terms of mouse traps. You have U-235 being, first you have a neutron hitting it. Hits the U-235, then that splits. Then this will produce a neutron coming off. It'll find the U-235, U-235 and so on and so on and so on. And so this whole uh, process keeps on going. It keeps on getting, continuing, sustaining a chain reaction. Here's a useful analogy, I think, to understand this. I think, it's just, uh, I think this works very well. Um, basically, what you're doing um, is you have, you know, like you have a bunch of mousetraps, right? You have a mousetrap and you have little 
ping pong balls, let's say, on one side. They have two ping pong balls. Each, each mousetrap has two ping pong balls. Right? And you put these mousetraps very close together. That's really what fissile material is, essentially. And so what, what you're doing is you're launching one of the ping pong balls, hits one of the mousetraps, and the mousetrap will go off, and that will kick off those two little ping pong balls, and they'll find a mousetrap, and that will go off. And so this process happens very, very rapidly. That's basically what it is. So the uh, ping pong balls represent the neutrons, and the mousetrap sort of unclamping simulates the whole fission, uh, fission process. So I have this here. I hope that this works. It's the volume. Where's the volume controlled? You don't want it to be too loud. It's a matter of clicking. That's okay. Essentially, what happens in a, in, a, in, a, in a nuclear weapon is exactly this. It's an uncontrolled fission process, an uncontrolled uh, chain reaction, whereas in nuclear reactors, it's, it's very much controlled. Okay, I hope I can do this. Okay, so this is an uncontrolled uh, chain reaction. So the first generation, you get your first split. And this happens in a very short amount of time. So the neutron finds another nucleus, and this will happen in something like 10 nanoseconds or 10 to the minus 8 seconds. So it's a very short time. They call this, you know, in the Manhattan Project, they call this the shake. Um, and so you can see this fission uh, process happening very fast. The first generation is basically one neutron, second generation three if you add all this up together, and so on. It continues uh, very fast. So here I'm assuming, maybe it's not du doubling. So here, here I'm not, not assuming doubling, I'm assuming tripling, so it's even faster. Um, so in 82 generations, 82 times that this splitting has happened, right, I've produced 2.4 times 10 to the 24 nuclei, right? Multiply that times the energy per fission. You see you have an enormous amount of energy. So I think I'll just come back to this a second later. Um, now, what we're going to do is just sort of quickly calculate what that energy is. Because if we talk about the energy per fission, remember I said it's 200 MeV, it's about, it's, it's about 200 MeV just as a simple number. It's more like 180, but let's say it's 200 MeV. Um, let's compare that to what that energy actually is per fission to the human world. Okay? A knee bend is 100 joules. So if I go like this, it's about 100 joules, right? That's what the energy is in the human world. Uh, now, I said that 200 MeV is an awful lot of energy, right? But here, it's only 3.2 times 10 to the minus 11 joules. That's even less than one millionth of a joule. So how can that possibly be, be a lot of energy? You know, what am I talking about? Well, the point is, there's 82 generations, right? 82 generations. So it's 2.4 times 10 to the 24 fissions that have happened in a very short amount of time. Um, Right, and in terms of the amount of time, that's what's so phenomenal. Remember I said that the shake is 10 nanoseconds, right? So 100 generations is about one millionth of a second. So this whole process really happens very fast. So that's why I think the video really demonstrates how fast this whole process could happen if uranium-235 were so close together, like they are for nuclear weapons. So let's calculate what the total energy is, right? This is easy to do. I know what the energy is per fission. That's 3.2 times 10 to the minus 11 um, joules per fission, right? I'm going to multiply this times the number of fissions, which was, you know, from before, uh, is 2.4 times 10 to the 24 uh, nuclei being produced after 82 generations. That's 7.68 times 10 to the, to the 13 joules. So suddenly we went from this very small unit, it seemed very small, times very many fissions, 
and we're back into very large numbers again in terms of energy. Right? We're talking about uh, 10 to the 13 joules compared to 100 joules being the, you know, a knee bend. So we're talking about an awful lot of energy again. And that's about equal to 18.3 um, kiloton of TNT, which is what, uh, what uh, Hiroshima was. That's equivalent to 0 0.94 kilograms of U-235. Less than a kilogram of uranium-235. The weapon itself on Hiroshima was 64, kilo they used 64 kilograms of fissile material. But actually, the amount that actually produced in all the energy, the energy release, was less than a kilogram. That's really amazing in terms of the energy. What more is what I wanted to show is uh, all this happens very fast. But at the first stage, because this process is, going, is happening very fast, at the first stage, um, it's, it's kind of a gentle giant that's starting to explode. And that's what I'm trying to show in this curve, because this shows the number of generations. And you see the amount of energy basically being produced uh, on the left side. 100% right? is the full energy. And um, the abscissa shows the number of generations. And you see how fast this is, this is developing, this exponential uh, uh, scale. So 99% of the 10 kiloton bomb, in this case the 10 kiloton bomb, same thing, um, was generated in the last 10 generations, right? So it's very, very fast, 100 nanoseconds, you generated all this, all this energy. Um, and the temperature inside the ball before it disassembles, inside this, this bomb as it disassembles, is almost the same temperature as the center of the sun, because basically what you're doing is you're dumping all this energy in a very small amount of space and it's got nowhere to go. So what happens? The pressure increases and it gets very, very hot. All the things are vibrating back and forth to produce an awful lot of, a lot of heat. It's going to be very hot. I'm going to get to why that's important. Here's another graph that kind of shows you, um, I think quite dramatically, the difference in scale. And I hope that this is <laughs> all done correctly. But what I'm showing on the left scale uh, the left side, the uh, vertical axis, is the uh, logarithm uh, of the kiloton TNT yield. So by logarithm, I mean really the exponent, essentially. And I'm going from minus 30 to 1, where 1 is uh, 1 kilogram of uranium-235 fission, just as we, as basically Hiroshima, as I was saying. So we started the chemical world, which I call the, the, the micro scale, and that's the one on the left here. Um, they were talking about the binding energy, and it's something like 10 to the minus 30 of that number of one kilogram TNT. Then we're talking about the binding energy of the nucleus, and that's considerably higher. As I said, it's about a million times higher. And so you sort of uh, go up there. It's better if I show it like this. Right, you go up here. Then you're in the human world, 100 joules, a few knee bends. Then one kilogram TNT. Finally, you have this one kilogram of, uh, uh, of uranium-235, and then the uh, Tohoku earthquake and uh, Tsar uh, Bomba, which was the, we're going to be talking about this, which was a very large 57, me the largest uh, test done, 57 megatons of TNT. So very large energies, and very, it's kind of nice to see sort of this, this progression of this scale. <coughs> so. The left side shows you the picture of what happens in, in, with nuclear reactors. Basically, you slow this whole process of this fissioning, you slow it all down. So instead of all this energy being produced in, you know, in a few hundred nanoseconds, you're producing it over months. And you slow it all down so that the process happens uh, continually, and you use this energy um, to, uh, for electricity generation. Yes? If the uranium-235 fissions by interaction with low-energy neutrons, and the neutrons from fission are created at a very high energy, uh -huh. how does the chain reaction take place so fast? Doesn't it take time for those neutrons to slow down? Um, so it's a very good point. In the case of nuclear reactors, you want to slow it down. In the case of nuclear, nuclear weapons, it doesn't really matter, because all the nuclei are so close together, it'll immediately find it. It doesn't matter whether it's slow or fast they'll still have a high, high uh, probability of finding it. But in the case of the nuclear reactor, and that's the whole trick that they do, is what they do is they slow the neutron down, because actually the probability of, of um, causing fissions to happen 
is, is higher for slower neutrons. I know it's kind of counterintuitive because you'd expect a fast one to have a higher probability, but it's actually in case of uranium-235, it's the slow neutrons that tend to uh, cause the process to happen. So what you do with nuclear reactors is you, you have something like water, a moderator, which slows the neutron down so that you don't have to have so much uranium-235, which is exactly the reason why in power reactors you only need about 3 to 5 percent uranium-235 compared to in nuclear weapons where you need to have 93 percent. Right, so it's, it's, that's, that's really what the difference is. You really hit on the main difference between civilian nuclear power and, and nuclear weapons, and that's really um, the whole process. Okay, so, but we're going to focus on, on, instead of harnessing the energy, <laughs> harnessing the energy for civilian purposes, we're going to focus, this, focus on har harvest, harnessing the energy for military purposes. So it's an uncontrolled, very fast, uncontrolled release of energy. And uh, I always find it so interesting that humans decided to, to look at the fast, uncontrolled energy rather than look at first developing nuclear power, which is really, I think, the proper way of doing it. But it's another thing. So we're going to talk about first pure fission weapons. So an uncontrolled reaction is, a very, is an extremely fast reaction. As I said, the whole thing process happens within a millisecond. It's a very fast process. Um, understanding neutron transport is critical. We're going to go through a little bit of detail um, because you, you can really understand a lot about how, nu how nuclear weapons work if you basically think like a neutron, if you think how, nu how neutrons um, interact. Uh, so, for example, some neutrons will escape or be absorbed. If they escape or absorbed, then they can't fission. Then they can't find a uranium-235 nuclei, so they won't fission them. So, what you don't want in nuclear weapons, you don't want, that, you don't want um, neutrons to escape or be absorbed. And we'll talk about that. Uh, you want to maximize the amount of neutrons that are avail available um, to fission. Basically, you're increasing the density of uranium-235. So exactly in this picture of the mousetraps, if you set the mousetraps further apart, then some of the neutrons, some of the ping-pong balls, won't find them, right? You really want them to be very close together and in a box and all this stuff, and then the process happens very fast. But if they're if you set them apart, some of them will get escaped or escape or, some, or something else will happen. And here is kind of showing a view graph of what are some of the neutron, things, neutron interactions that could happen. And this is kind of helpful to understand how nuclear weapons work. So the first thing that can happen is um, you could have just simply elastic scattering. Basically, the neutron hits the uranium-235 or whatever, whatever isotope it is, and it just scatters off, right? Nothing really happens. The other thing that can happen is the neutron can get absorbed by uranium-238 or uranium-235, and it basically grabs the neutron, holds on to it, and so that neutron can't continue to find more uranium-235s, holds on to it and gives off a, another particle, a gamma ray or something like this. So those are some of, some of the things that can happen. The other thing is it can just completely escape so it doesn't actually find another U-235, it just basically just escapes the whole process, and then doesn't ever bounce back, so it's a lost neutron. And that's not what you want for nuclear weapons. What you want is you want those guys to stay inside so that they can find more uranium-235 and split more and more, and the whole process can continue. Um, so, and this is this whole point about critical mass, which you often hear about, right? What you want with critical mass is you want to sustain a chain reaction. You want the, the chain reaction to keep on going. How do you do that? Well, by increasing the amount of mass that you have. So let's look on the left side, right? The left side shows uh, this one here that I'm talking about. You have very little material, right? So a neutron comes in here, finds U-235, right? This will cause another neutron to come off. It finds another U-235, but look at these neutrons. They're all escaping. Right? They're all escaping or being absorbed. They're not finding other neutrons which are, which, are, uh, which are going to fission. So that's not going to sustain a chain reaction. It's going to stop right away. So that's not a critical mass. That's subcritical. Now, in this case here, uh, in, in this case, what you have is, since the material is much larger, right, you have the, the neutron comes, in, comes on here, it causes this to fission. Then you get neutrons coming in here, uh, com coming in here and they'll find other U-235, and then some of them will go back into the material, and some of them will want to escape. 
Well, you have a certain probability of once going back into the material, finding other U-235 compared to the ones that escape. Now, if you start to get more fissioning than you get escaping, then you start to sustain a chain reaction, and that's what happens when you have a critical mass. Okay? So that's really, really the difference. Now, the critical mass really depends on whether you sustain a chain reaction, depends on the geometry that you have. If you're a clever country who wants to build a nuclear weapon, then to save yourself on fissile material, which is going to be very difficult, you might want to have some sort of reflector on the outside. And basically what this is, you often hear about this, beryllium reflectors, and all they're doing is reflecting the neutrons back into the, into the, into the fissile material. And so the, so the higher probability, a higher percentage of them, will actually find a U-235 nuclei. Right? So you actually need less material. And that's what I'm showing here. Right? Here I have much less material than I have here. These are spheres, right? in terms of volume, mass. Um, this is very different. I could get away with losing, using much less fissile material because I had this reflector around it. And instead of these guys escaping, they're going to bounce back um, into the material and find another U-235 to fission. So that's one of the advantages. Now you understand everything about nuclear weapons, essentially, right? the, the critically important thing. Now you also understand why people would, would want to use a reflector and all this. So basically what I'm showing in this scale is increasing fissile mass and what's really happening uh, physically and what really uh, critical mass really means. I like this, uh, what I call the crowded room analogy. And this is really showing two different types of nuclear weapons, the gun type weapon and the implosion type weapon. This is really the difference between the two. Um, on, the, on the right side, I'm showing a gun type weapon. And that's basically, if I gather the critical mass together, I can cause the whole, uh, you know, the whole process to happen. The whole, I can sustain a chain reaction. This can happen very fast, as long as I have enough critical mass. On the left side, instead of having a large critical mass, what I've done is I've increased the density. So the distance between U-235 nuclei is actually shorter now. It's it just basically uh, shrink the whole room so that the density is higher. And this is called an implosion type weapon. So really you can think of this as, um, you know, you're, you're taking this ball, you're taking this ball and you're kicking it into this room and you're seeing whether it will hit this, this U2, U-235. If the density is higher, in this case, the room is higher, so the neutron will find another U-235, it just has to go further, but it'll, it'll find, uh, it'll in the end, find it. But on the left side, it's so dense that it will find it. Even though the room is smaller, it's so dense, so it'd find a U-235. Am I explaining this clearly, I hope? Yes. It's going to be more clear later on, I think. So the goal here is to increase the probability of fission to occur. That's the whole goal of this uh, process. If you're losing neutrons from a nuclear weapon point of view, that's not good because then you can't cause these things, to f the U-235 or the fissile material to fission. So the first is the gun type weapon, uh, uh, which, you've, which you've heard before. And in this case, basically what you're doing is you have um, two pieces which are subcritical mass, so they're less than a critical mass. Let's say it's half a critical mass, and you're firing one into the other, and they're combining, right? Well, if you combine half critical mass plus another half critical mass, you have one critical mass. And so you can get this whole chain reaction to happen. And that's basically um, what, you what you do in a gun-type weapon. You have to do this quite fast, because you have to make sure there's no stray neutrons coming in that, just, as you're just about to assemble them, uh, cause the whole process to sort of not work properly. So you have to assemble it quickly. Um, but you, do this, you can do this with uh, uranium-235. And this is the bomb design uh, which was uh, dropped on uh, Hiroshima. So basically what you're doing is you have a hollow uranium bullet, essentially, and you have a, have a cylinder target, and you're shooting one into the other. And so when they combine, that's when you formed one critical mass, and that's when you have this uh, process happening very quickly. <clears throat> Uh, uh, this is just showing, showing uh, Ted Taylor, who said something. Uh, the amounts of U-235, as small as one kilogram, are significant quantities. Really, I'm showing this is because the IEA says the, the significant quantity is 25 kilograms of uranium, right? Um, well, actually, you need very, if, you, if you have very high enrichment, you need a very small amount of, 
uh, of fissile material to produce a nuclear weapon. If you want to do sophisticated nuclear weapons, it's of the order of kilograms, not tens of kilograms. Um, so this is a quote from uh, Ted Taylor, who's a well-known uh, nuclear weapons designer. I think I'm going to, okay, yes, I'm going to be talking about this. So uh, and this is just showing a picture of the devastation of Hiroshima. Um, what's left behind is, are all these fission products, right? All the radioactivity is left behind, and that's what I want to talk about uh, next. So you have the blast wave, and you have all the destruction, but then you also have radioactivity, which is left behind, which goes into the atmosphere, goes onto the ground, goes into the air, uh, into the water, and so on. So I just want to do an aside uh, on the sources of radioactivity from nuclear explosions. So when I said that the U-235 splits, and I had this sort of graphic where it seemed like it splits in half. Well, it doesn't split in half. It splits in many different ways. In fact, it can split into two or three pieces, even three pieces. So instead of U-235 splitting in one, into two, it can split into three. And it splits with a certain distribution of, uh, of elements. And in this case, it's isotopes, right? So that's how you get a vast array of different isotopes being produced um, through the fission process. Uh, and these isotopes, of course, are radioactive. And that's, uh, that's the concern. So what I'm showing is the distribution, the fission yield is basically the percentage of, um, uh, of different elements that are produced as a function of something fish, fissioning. So here you see in about 6% of the time, um, you produce strontium-90, right? And something similar, because it's right there at the peak, you produce cesium-137. Right? These are the ones that we really worry about because they have a half-life of about 30 years. Both of, both of them. So they stay around for a very long time. Now, um, strontium-90 is produced, which decays to iterium, never notice, 90, Y90, which is a half-life of 64 hours, and that emits a beta, um, meaning that six strontium-90s are produced. Okay, so that's saying 6%. Uh, uh, that's what I was saying before. Six strontium-90s are produced per 100 fissions. The problem is that strontium-90, the body mistakes it for calcium, and so this uh, deposits in the bone. So it's particularly uh, a dangerous material. On the right side, I have cesium-137, um, which decays to uh, barium-137. And 94% of the time that barium-137M decays, um, it emits a beta with 670 keV, which is particularly strong uh, uh, gamma. Right? This is what's so dangerous um, uh, to us. And with cesium-137, the body mistakes it for potassium, which is required for all living things. So that's how sort of the damage happens. And as these particles decay further, as these isotopes decay further, the damage this does if it's inside the body, you basically have these little particles that are hitting cells and, and are, are damaging cells. That's the whole point about radioactivity, right? Um, so, that's, so that's what happens. So the, the betas deposit all the energy in a short distance. So this is the difference between betas and gammas, the way this works. Um, betas deposit all energy in a very short distance in tissue. Uh, it's, betas, betas are dangerous if ingested, ingested or inhaled. Gamma ra radiation tends to be very penetrating. That's really the difference between uh, these two. Uh, and can damage cells and lead to cancer. And basically the damage is related to the type and the number of particles emitted. That's the thing that I'm trying to tell you. So if you ingest some radioactive material, it doesn't stop giving off particles. The problem is that inside your body, it will keep on giving off particles. Of course, you get rid of that material, and there's a half-life associated um, with uh, you know, the process of you actually getting rid of the material. But it's still there. Some of it's still there. And it, these particles are coming off, and they're damaging you know, where the material is actually located. It could be very soft uh, tissue. Um, so, uh, just to talk a bit more about fission products. Uh, most, most fission uh, products tend to be radioactive. Um, many of them have a half-life which is less than a minute. So that means that a lot of them will decay very quickly. And so you don't have to worry about it over uh, long terms. Uh, noble gases such as xenon-133, xenon-135, the ones that are important for the CTBT, and you'll have tons of lectures about this, I'm sure. And I think you'll visit the radionuclide station um, up here, uh, xenon-133 and xenon-135 have uh, longer half-life, so 
five days compared to nine hours, and that's what allows you to do verification uh, of the CTBT. But then you have these longer life fission products, the ones that I talked about, strontium-90 and cesium-137, and I already talked about how dangerous these materials are, that have a half-life of, of about 30 years. Uh, and then you have iodine-131, which I'm sure you've heard about um, with Fukushima last year, uh, which is a half-life of eight days. So that will also disappear um, pretty quickly. Radioactivity, radioactivity itself follows a relatively simple decay. Oh, I don't want to go, I don't think I have that slide, so I won't show that. Um, and then there's also induced radioactivity. So I talked about the fission products that are produced, but if you think about the process of a weapon going off, right, you have the fission, the fission products that are released, but then there's also a whole lot of neutrons that are released. These neutrons can find other materials. And when they find other materials, they'll connect with it and produce more radioactive materials. And that's the, that's the problem. So here, for example, um, so yes, yeah, so it's caused by neutrons interacting in the environment, which obviously depends on where the tests are conducted. So if a test is done uh, underground or whether it's done in the atmosphere, it's going to give you a very different uh, amount of induced radioactivity. So for example, if you're looking at atmosphere, a test in the atmosphere, well, if, if it's in the atmosphere, there's an awful lot of nitrogen uh, around us, right? Nitrogen is part of air, so there's a lot of nitrogen. And when the neutrons hit nitrogen-14, right, then they turn into carbon-14, which I'm showing up there. And carbon-14 is very radioactive. It has a 5730-year uh, half-life. So you're producing, through this process, your, this induction process of these neutrons, you're producing radioactive materials. So this is not the fission products. This is just the process of neutrons hitting air, air molecules, right? And through this process, you're producing this radioactive material. And then you can also produce tritium, which is another very dangerous uh, uh, radioactive isotope, right? The tritium is an isotope of hydrogen. It's one proton and two neutrons, so it adds up to three. And it's going to become more important later on when they discuss boosted weapons. The other thing is, if you, um, if you do the explosions under the sea, well, what's seawater made out of? It's salt water, right? Salt is sodium. So you have sodium-23 plus neutrons produces sodium-24. And sodium-24 has a 15-hour half-life and a 4 MeV beta, which is particularly high energetic beta. So if you're exposed to that radiation, um, that's also very dangerous. And there's this case where I have this quote, hairy chested disdain for unseen hazard. This was from, a, uh, from one of the reports where uh, naval officers uh, uh, swam in uh, the Bikini Lagoon where the tests went off. And they got a lot, exposed to a lot of sodium-24. Uh, sodium so a very, very sad case. Um, this is just showing the worldwide environmental inventory, and I don't really want to go in through it in too much detail, and, because you can, uh, I just want to have this kind of this reference, uh, reference point of showing the difference between the environmental inventory um, for atmospheric and underground tests and so on. So what you see is that strontium-90 uh, is more like 11 million uh, curry. Curry is a very large unit, actually. It's 3.7 times 10 to the 10, so 10 million, uh, no, sorry, 10 billion um, uh, decays per second. So when you have a curry, it's an actually very large uh, unit. In fact, a curry is equal to a gram of radium-226. That's how a curry was um, defined. Um, so uh, globally, you have about 11 million uh, curry. For strontium and for cesium, you have about uh, 20 million curries. So this is, this is a large amount of material that you've just thrown up in the atmosphere. You have also carbon-14 and plutonium-39, just from the, uh, from the process itself. Um, the total yield, and this assumes a total yield of 550 megatons uh, TNT, where 40% was fission and 60% is due to diffusion uh, weapons. Underground tests, you had about 500 uh, Soviet tests, which was about 31 megatons, and seven, 730 US tests, which uh, was about 37 megatons. So that adds up to about 71 megatons uh, of material that you've deposited underground. And here the strontium-90 is similar. You have uh, 5 million curry, and cesium-130 is about 8, 10 million curry, and so on. 
Um, I don't really want to go through too much detail there. On top of that, you also have uh, tests that were done in space, right? And these actually um, change some of the configuration of what's called the Van Allen belts, which are these belts of, um, of ways of uh, transporting uh, charged particles in the, high up in the atmosphere above the Earth. And these actually um, change these, the patterns of these um, and also led to more contamination. So, uh, you know, all these tests have had a, had, a, had a big impact. So that was just kind of an aside because I wanted to give this sense at, at uh, you know, how much material was actually put into the air and in the ground and so on. So now let's talk about implosion type weapon. So now we're talking about the other case where, I, where basically we are increasing the density. Remember I showed you the example of the, what I call the crowded room example? In this case, what you're doing is you're increase, you're, you're basically um, crowding the room. So actually the picture that I wanted to say is the, the uranium-235 actually represented people at a party. And somebody opens a door and throws a neutron <laughs> in. And so you have a high chance of hitting, it, hitting them. That's really what I meant to say with this crowded room analogy. So on the left side I had, if you increase the amount of people, you have a higher chance of hitting somebody if you throw a tennis ball. And that's essentially what you're doing in this case with the, um, with the implosion type weapon. And so what you have here is you're increasing the density of the plutonium. So you start out with basically a shell of subcritical uh, plutonium-239. In this case, we're talking about plutonium. Um, or well, it can also be uranium. But you start out with a sort of a shell, spherical shell. And that's going to be less than one critical mass, way less than one critical mass. And that's good, because that means it's much safer. If you're working with materials that are already close to critical mass, that's, uh, it's not so safe. So gun-type weapons are not so safe. So here what you have is you're taking that, those shell and you have, an ex have explosives on the outside and you're basically causing this to implode. So by having it go out like this, right, you have these lenses essentially, uh, uh, explosive lenses, it, it pushes inward and causes it to reach a very high uh, density and there it will reach critical mass. So that's basically how it works. Um, you have these what I call explosive lenses here, oh, I'm sorry. It's like this. So, so you're basically imploding the material. So here is your fissile material, and you're imploding it, and it goes inward, and then it becomes a much smaller volume, right? And you have a very high density of the same material and a very much smaller, uh, uh, much smaller volume. And this was the design which was uh, dropped on Nagasaki. Um, this is just showing another, uh, another picture of it. So basically what you're doing is you're uh, you're taking your fissile material and you're crushing it so that the so that it'll find the neutrons much easier. Uh, you're basically just bringing the atoms closer together so it'll the neutrons will find the U-235 or, or plutonium. Now it's not as easy as it looks and this is kind of trying to demonstrate uh, what the process is. You know how when you have a water balloon and you're trying to squish it, uh, squish it uh, perfectly symmetrically, that's very difficult because it tends to go between your fingers, right? So it's not actually something that you would expect a non-state actor to be able to do um, because, it's, because it's, it's, it's quite sophisticated. Um, but the difference is from the gun type is that you need to test it, right? So if you need to test it, you have the CTBT, which is there uh, to, uh, to stop you from, uh, to be able to, to monitor that. And um, oh, so this is showing a picture of the uh, Trinity test, which was the first uh, nuclear test uh, with uh, uh, of the implosion type type weapon. Uh, very dramatic. Again, you have the same kind of um, radioactivity that's left behind, and and so on. Incredible devastation. Now let's talk about modern nuclear weapons. Okay, so basically we went through Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now we're going to transport in time to more modern nuclear weapons. And we're called boosted and uh, multi-stage nuclear weapons. Now this is what a more modern nuclear weapon looks like. So what you have is, uh, you still have the same thing, same implosion type weapon where you have your fissile material and you're crushing it together to reach the high density and so you get the critical mass forming. It's still very similar, but what you do is you have a clever trick. And what you do is, remember that I said that once you throw all that energy in a very small space, then you produce very high temperatures. 
Well, if you re reach high enough temperatures, temperatures that are equivalent to the center of the sun, then basically what you're doing, you could, you could cause the fusion process to happen. And what you do with boosted weapons, it's not really a fusion weapon, not in the same sense that I'm going to be talking about multi-stage weapon, but basically what you're, do, what you're doing is you're, um, you're boosting the weapon by producing a whole bunch of neutrons. So what I said was that the Hiroshima weapon was only 64 kilograms, or sorry, was 64 kilograms of fissile material, but only one kilogram was actually fissioned. That's a very low density. If you want to produce a very powerful nuclear weapon, then you want to have a high, higher um, efficiency. You want all of it to, to fission, not just less than one kilogram. So how would you do that? Well, with this way, with, by boosting it, if you reach the high enough temperature, you can cause a fusion reaction to happen. And you use tritium and deuterium. And we're going to talk about that a little later. I don't think I have the description here. And you cause a fusion event to happen, fusion to happen. And what this does is it basically uh, produces a whole bunch of neutrons. These neutrons will go out very quickly and find the other fissile material that was lost in the first process. And so you increase your efficiency of, of uh, having the, uh, the weapon explode and, and, and uh, getting as high yield as possible. So boosted weapons use a very small quantity, a few grams of uh, deuterium tritium gas, which is injected right into the center of the primary. We're going to be talking about the primary in, in, and the secondary. The primary is basically the fission part of the weapon. And D and T are isotopes of hydrogen. Um, D is deuterium, that's one proton, one neutron and tritium is one proton, two neutrons. That's basically the difference between the two isotopes. Uh, to initiate fusion, you need fission, right? So if you want to make a fusion weapon, that's where we're going to be talking multi-stage weapon, you need to have fission to get to the right temperature. You can't use a conventional weapon because conventional weapons just can't have the same temperature. You can't get to the temperature where you get fusion to happen, right? So only fission will do that, and that's why um, when you talk about multi-stage weapon, you have first a fission and then a fusion uh, process. Um, we'll talk about that. Uh, neutrons are released, which floods the core and increases the efficiency of fissions, because you still have the fissile materials that's there, and these neutrons will find that fissile material and, and increase the probability of it fissioning itself. Right? It's just a matter of probability. I mean, I, I'm trying to explain the whole process, it's really just a matter of probabilities. That's how you have to think. If you increase the number of neutrons, then the probability is higher that it's going to fission the fissile material, right? So the process here is just increasing the amount of neutrons, having a burst of neutrons there that will increase, even though the efficiency is low before, if you then have a whole flood of neutrons coming, then you increase the efficiency of the final, uh, final yield. I hope, I hope that's clear. Okay, so now let's talk about multi-stage uh, nuclear weapon. In this case, we have fission, fusion, we'll talk about all these different ones. Fission, fusion, fission, fusion, fission, enhanced radiation, and salted bombs. Um, they use both fission and fusion to produce yield. Now, generally, we don't talk about boosted weapon as being fusion weapons, because you're not really using fusion energy so much. You're just using the neutrons to speed up the whole process. Right? That's really what you're doing, just speeding up the whole, whole process so that you get, uh, you know, get a lot of high, high efficiency of neutrons um, uh, producing fissions. Okay, so this is actually what I was talking about, why the fusion process happens. If the temperature is high enough, as I said, it has to be re reaching a very, very high temperature, which you have during a fission weapon, then what happens is the deuterium and, and, and the tritium will fuse together essentially produce an alpha and a neutron, and 17.6 MeV, which is again a very large amount of energy. Not as high as fission, but if you have a whole lot of these, then suddenly you get into very, uh, very high energies. And what happens when the D and T join, uh, sorry, so you should produce a lot of energy, which is what you want. You will also produce a lot of neutrons, which you want in a boosted weapon. Um, now, if you really want to compare all of this in terms of the energy, um, if you have 17.6 MeV being, being given off and you have five particles coming in, because basically what you have is you have what's called atomic mass units, which is basically the mass of the proton and neutron. Let's assume that they're about the same thing. 
Okay? So we have D plus T. The D, as I said, is one proton plus one neutron. Tritium is one proton plus two neutrons, so that's five. Right? So if you look at the energy per proton, reactant, proton or, or neutron, then it's about 17.6 divided by five. Right? That's the, the five that you had before. So you get 3.5 MeV per AMU. Now, if you compare this to fission, which I said is an awful lot of energy, but these are very large nuclei, so it's, it's hard to compress them um, together, whereas protons and neutrons, uh, if you have you know, very light materials, it's very easy to compress them. So you can have a very high amount of nuclei in a very small volume. Um, the fission en energy per mass is 200 divided by 235. 235 is the number of neutrons plus protons, right? So you have about 200 MeV divided by 235, that's less than 0.85 MeV per AMU. So you have a, have a significant increase in the, case of, uh, in the case of fusion than you have compared to, uh, uh, you have compared to fission. And the temperature, uh, it's, it's very short, uh, before the weapon blows apart, it's about the center of the sun, and you need this to get the fusion uh, reaction to happen. Now, I want to show, I don't know if this is on the next slide or not. Yes, this is just showing a picture, although it's a little oval, because so I had to stretch it, uh, of the sun, just showing a picture of the sun. Uh, modern desi designs of uh, nuclear weapons, they use a fission bomb, to, I'm going to show this later, I mean, it might be a bit confusing now. Modern designs use a fission bomb to produce sufficient heat to detonate the fusion fuel. Let's, so first you have a primary that produces the, that the primary is where you have the fission process happening, right? That produces a whole lot of heat. That heat gets transported to the, to the, uh, to the fusion fuel and that will cause the fusion process to happen. That's where you get most of your energy in these modern, uh, modern weapons. Uh, designs of the secondary, so the primary is the fission weapon, the secondary is the fusion uh, weapon, uh, differs for diff different intended effects, and we're going to be uh, talking about that a little bit. Um, design of the primary is designed to be as safe as possible from the point of view of inadvertent detonation, and we won't talk about that. But uh, okay, good enough. This is a picture of, of a, a more modern nuclear weapon. This is what it looks like. So what you have is, you have on the, on the left side, I'm showing that work? Yes. Um, the left side, you have the, uh, what's called the primary. So that's what I said is the, is the fission part of the weapon. So that's where I show one and two. Okay, so that's the left side. That's the fission weapon. And on the right side, you have what's called the secondary. And that's where the fusion, uh, fusion, uh, fusion weapon is. Let me just use this. I hope you can hear when I'm like, standing like this. So what you see here is, so this is the, this is the primary and this is the secondary. Um, the first part of the process is the actual implosion process, right? So you're imploding the, um, uh, the, the shell, whatever the shell is, whatever the fissile material is, uranium-235 or plutonium-239. You're causing it to implode. And then, just as it reaches a, a very high temperature, you put, bring in the, the tritium and the deuterium, and that causes the boosted phase. So that's where you produce so, much, so many neutrons, you increase efficiency. Then the third step is, right, you've now produced a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of heat. Then the third step is to actually, in an efficient way, transfer that heat of that, that fission, fissioning weapon, the, the, the primary, transfer that heat to the secondary, and do that in a way to heat that area to a temperature that's high enough to cause fusion to happen in the secondary. It's called the Teller-Ulam uh, method. And basically what you're doing is you're, uh, and yes, I want to, so I'll talk about that later. In modern weapons, you don't use D and T in the secondary. Remember I said in the boosted uh, part of the weapon, you use tritium gas uh, with deuterium. That's what you use in boosted weapons. But in modern weapons, in the, in the secondary, what you use is lithium deuteride. And why you do that, it's a very clever trick, is that if you see in the process up here, right up there, it's really funny to do this like this. Um, you have tritium plus deuterium produces a neutron, right? This neutron can interact with lithium-6. So if you have lithium there, it can produce more tritium. And so you can get the cycle going where, you're, where you can produce more tritium and deuterium and get the whole, whole uh, um, process going. 
Uh, and so you don't need a gas, because if you have a gas, then it's going to be complicated, because you need to cool the gas down, refrigerate it, so it gets basically into liquid form. Well, then you get into very complicated weapons. In this way, you just use lithium deuteride as your weapon. You have the deut deuteride, the deuterium there, and you have the lithium, which you convert to tritium. So all you need is a solid material of lithium deuteride, which you can have, it's just a solid, uh, as, part of your, uh, as part of your fusion fuel. You don't need to have tritium gas. Um, so that was, that was a very clever trick to produce your uh, uh, fusion uh, yield. So, so, the, so what I'm showing on the, on the right side is I'm showing the, the red part there um, is the plutonium spark plug. They call it the spark plug, but it's basically fissile material. Then in white, I'm showing, or in yellow, I'm showing the fusion fuel. That's that lithium deuteride that I was telling you about that will produce tritium when it gets neutrons. Um, and then outside, I'm showing a U238 tamper. Now, that's going to be important, the tamper, and what the tamper actually is. In this case, I'm showing U238. So if in this fusion process, you produce a whole lot of neutrons happening, those neutrons will find the uranium-238. And when they find uranium-238, they'll cause more fission process to happen. So this, what I'm showing you, is a fission-fusion-fission fission weapon, right? Its first stage, the, the primary, is causing the fission weapon. The second part is the fusion process that you're producing. But then you also have a fissioning of the temper itself. Right? and also of the spark plug itself. Yeah. So you get a lot, of, uh, a lot of neutrons and you get a lot of dirty uh, products as well. And then furthermore, you have, the, uh, you have a mantle on the outside, which I'm showing here, which is all around this, which could also be made of uranium-238. So you get further fissioning happening for the neutrons that are flowing out. Right? So this is all to have neutron economy so that you produce a whole lot of neutrons and a whole lot of uh, um, fissions. Now, it's, to me, this is really amazing. Um, it, one, mega, me, one megaton bomb uses a few kilograms of lithium deuteride, fusion weapon, uh, several kilograms of plutonium, about four or five kilograms. The mantle is about 100 kilograms. Um, so you have several hundred kilograms. That's the size of the, that's the mass of the physics part of the, of the weapon, which is really amazing. So a several hundred kilogram bomb can produce explosive power of 100 million, uh, sorry, one, 1 billion uh, kilogram TNT. It's, it's really amazing. This is just, and I don't really want to go through too much detail here, you're basically, for the different types of weapon, you're basically varying the temper, right? So you're varying, in your secondary, you're varying this part here, the gray part of your, uh, in, in, in the graph up there. So for a, a fission-fusion weapon, in this case, you have no uranium-238 tamper. You use something else, some, something like lead. Um, then it's, uh, it's going to be cleaner from the point of view. It's, okay, it's not clean. None of these weapons are clean. But at least you don't have the, uh, the U-238 in your, in your tamper, which is going to produce all these extra uh, uh, fission products. And then you can have enhanced radiation, which is going to be transparent to neutrons. So you get an awful lot of uh, neutrons being produced. Um, well, you have, okay, I don't, I don't really want to go uh, to too much here. But there are these different types of stages, different, different types of weapon, weapons. And they vary in different ways. Uh, and of course, a lot of this is classified. But basically, you're varying the temper in these different types of weapons. This is showing, I think this is a B61 bomb, I don't remember. Um, this is the only picture you can ever find, you always see this, of a bomb being disassembled and you can see all the different parts um, that it's, it's made out of. And today's discussion, uh, when I talked earlier about dismantlement of bombs, you can see how complicated this would be in the whole process. And safety is so important too, right? It's not just uh, fissile materials or radioactive materials, there's also other, there's asbestos and there's all kinds of other uh, chemical toxic materials that you, have, that you have to take into account in the whole process. So safety is really important. And when I talk about dismantlement, I'm not wide-eyed about all this. It's, it's, it's a really complicated uh, process. It has to be done very carefully, take into account safety and so on. Okay, we don't have to go <laughs> through this. I think, did John show this? So I don't need to show this. Yeah, okay. Uh, 
this is just showing the uh, uh, nuclear testing over the years, and on the abscissa, I'm showing you know uh, first use uh, going to uh, modern times. Um, and I'm showing different tests that would, that, oh, oh, did I not stop this? Can you turn on the volume? Because it's going to continue. Usually when I show this to students, when I teach in Monterey, you sort of hear this in the background. So what I do is I, I continue to teach the, uh, the rest of the lecture and then, you know, and I talk more detail about testing and you hear this in the background. But this is going to get loud. Yeah, thanks. Louder? No, 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 all the way down. Because you've heard this before, I think. Have they heard this before? Yes. Because it's nice to hear in the background. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Could get loud. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm showing the uh, I'll continue. This is just showing sort of decades of, you know, all the nuclear testing that had been done. So do you have control over the volume? Uh-oh. Well. Let's see. Oh, that'll do it. It's okay like this. Okay. You sure? Yeah. Okay, I've turned it off. But it's worthwhile, if you haven't seen that, that video, I don't know if Jean showed it, it's really worthwhile seeing, it gives a new perspective about really what happened um, over all those decades of testing. Okay, so we start with the, um, uh, R, it's, it's, it's not RD1, I think it's, RD, it's RDS1. No, yeah, it's RDS1, which was the uh, Soviet, Soviet Union first test in 1949. Um, this was a 22 kiloton uh, plutonium weapon, I believe. So they didn't have the uranium uh, yet. So you'd think that st uh, state actors, they're more interested, I think, from my point of view, in, in doing a first test with plutonium, not, not with uranium, especially because plutonium is easy to produce and uranium isn't. Right? With uranium, you have to enrich it, which is a complicated process. With plutonium, you can produce it in nuclear reactors. In fact, the first Indian test uh, was done with the Cirrus reactor, um, the uh, Canadian uh, reactor, using the plutonium from this heavy water reactor. So you actually, they actually produced the plutonium. Okay, so then uh, as, as, as tests continue of the Castle Bravo uh, test, which was the first lithium deuteride test. So the Mike test, which was a particularly large one, which was 12 megatons, um, used a cryogenic system. Remember I told you about the uh, deuterium and tritium? It's a gas. So if you want to use it in the bomb, which they wanted to do, then you'd, uh, you'd have to first cool the gas down. So it becomes a really complicated experiment. Basically, they had a, a room. Uh, it's not really a, a weapon that you could ever use. Uh, uh, not that you would want to use any weapons, but it's, it's, not, it's not a really a design that you could use because it's so large, because you had the whole refrigerator, essentially, cryogenically cool uh, uh, the tritium, the tritium tritium. Um, so instead, then, in the Castle Bravo test, uh, they used lithium deuteride for the first time. And in that case, they had uh, uh, a very, very high yield. Uh, that was 15 uh, megatons. It was a very, very, very high yield. And then later on, they had the, uh, the Tsar Bomba test, which is, sorry, it's 50 megatons. It's more like 57 uh, megaton test. I'm sorry I say cleanest. That's uh, almost a typo. <laughs> um, it was clean from a certain point of view, but it, of course it wasn't clean. Um, it produced a lot of uh, fission products. And basically, there's this rush to maximize the yield to weight ratio. If you want to weaponize this and put this on missiles, then you have to make sure that it's a certain size that it can go on the weapons, a certain weight. Right? You can't have it to be as heavy as a cryogenic uh, weapon because you wouldn't be able to put it on a missile, so it would be completely impractical. And so they continued with all this testing. Um, then I showed the 1964 uh, 596 uh, China um, HEU implosion. They used HEU first, not uh, plutonium, uh, but generally many of the other ones, India used plutonium first and the UK used uh, plutonium first. Then there was a smiling Buddha test, uh, which was eight kiloton, which was the first non-P5 test. Uh, and, and this was the one that was used, uh, the, the, the India test. 
Then later on, you had the CTBT uh, coming online. I show here the partial test ban treaty too. Um, and then there was the Pakistan uh, Chagai uh, one uh, test, um, which was, let me see, oh, which was underground test. I don't have what the yield was. This was 1998. And then, of course, you have the DPRK tests. This is just to give you a sense at, uh, you know, what are the tests uh, that have gone on. And there's thousands of tests. And all are trying to uh, understand different processes in uh, nuclear weapons, whether it's um, uh, calibrating the codes that were used to, uh, um, to understand how the, how the yield would be developed and these kinds of things. Um, all the tests had kind of like a, uh, had a purpose, a specific purpose. Now, um, uh, here's some quotes from uh, Bruce Goodwin, who is the principal associate director for weapons at Livermore National Laboratory, just reflecting on the fact that um, they've learned a lot since testing has stopped. They've learned a lot about nuclear weapons since testing has stopped. Uh, we have a more fundamental understanding of how these weapons work today than we ever imagined when we were blowing them up. And then the other quote is from uh, NNSA, uh, nuclear, National Nuclear Security Administration Administrator Thomas D'Agostino, saying we know more about the complex issues of nuclear weapon performance today than we ever did during a period of nuclear testing. So what it's trying to emphasize is that they know enough. They don't need to be uh, necessarily blowing things up uh, to, uh, to learn more about these nuclear weapons. They can learn these from past tests and um, uh, you know, they've calibrated their codes from my point of view. Okay. So this is just to summarize uh, the presentation. Uh, you have vastly more energy from nuclear reactions than chemical reactions. That's really the difference between, uh, you know, civilian explosives and, uh, um, uh, you know, chemical explosions and, and nuclear explosions. The critical mass is the mass of fissile material required to sustain the chain reaction. Uh, I described these three, three phases. The first use phase is the gun type and an implosion type weapon. Then bigger, better, and safer. You have boosted weapons and multi-stage uh, uh, weapons. And then the industrial <laughs> scale and the uh, reduction phase. And I think that's where we are now. That's it, I think. Do we have any questions? I just have one question. Earlier, I think we uh, learned that one of the reasons for the ZTPTO was that there seems to be a consequence between testing and weapons. And if the United States feels they don't need to test anymore, but can still improve their arsenal, isn't that negating one of the precepts of the CTPT? Um, maybe I'm not understanding your question. If you, okay, you say it again. I'm sorry. We learned earlier from, from Mr. Dupree's yes. that he felt that there was first the test and then there was the improvement of the weapons. With yes. every improvement, there was a subsequent test and it was a regenerative cycle or a degenerative cycle, as you might wish. So if the United States feels it doesn't need to test anymore, then it kind of makes me feel that the CTPTO, by limiting testing, really is not limiting the spread of nuclear weapons or the modernization of the arsenal. Um, well, I'm not quite sure how to answer that. To be honest, do you want to comment? Well, thank you. Maybe I might just make a comment about that. Um, uh, I think that, uh, at least in the United States at the moment, uh, the, uh, the U.S. government has uh, taken the position that it will not uh, seek to develop new military capabilities for its existing uh, weapons but that it expects to uh, uh, retain uh, the existing weapons in a, a reliable and safe uh, uh, and secure uh, mode, and that it will pursue uh, the uh, non-testing uh, uh, technical efforts at the weapons uh, laboratories uh, to ensure that. Uh, the National Academy uh, report that was issued about a year ago mm -hmm. uh, does speak to the uh, ability to do some uh, modifications to existing weapons that would be uh, confined to the uh, envelope of previously tested designs. 
So there may be some limited uh, uh, scope for certain modifications that might be uh, carried out uh, with a view to changing the military characteristics of the, of the bombs. But clearly any uh, major departure from what's already been uh, achieved through the testing programs uh, could not be pursued without further testing. Uh, and clearly uh, across the spectrum of states that have tested, uh, you have great uh, variety uh, of, of uh, a database that's been assembled either by the, the states that have tested a lot, like the Soviet, uh, Russian Federation, France, China, the United States, and states that have tested very little, like uh, India, Pakistan, and North Korea, and uh, were testing to resume, I think it would be a, a, a almost foregone conclusion uh, that states with less testing experience could acquire a great deal more uh, in terms of, of flexibility and pursuing military uh, objectives that they might have or might not. However, it would be up to them to, to be thinking about that. And that in that context, uh, the prohibition on testing remains a very strong barrier to uh, uh, what you might call vertical proliferation, the right. additional uh, addition, the, the acquisition of additional uh, military capabilities through testing. And so it, it remains, I think, a strong barrier to, uh, to further expansion of military capabilities. E even if there's some flexibility that has come about as a consequence of the advances in computer simulation and, and uh, non-nuclear experimental uh, capabilities. Yes. Chen. Yes. Um, especially with um, boosted weapons? Yes. I don't quite understand where the risk of predetonation comes from. Uh, I, okay, I don't think I talked about predetonation so much with uh, boosted weapons. Uh, the predetonation comes with gun type weapons. And the problem is that if you're using, so say you use a plutonium, um, plutonium gives off, it's a problem with plutonium compared to uranium. Plutonium gives off a whole lot of neutrons per second, per gram whole lot of neutrons. So if you want to trigger it at the right moment, say a gun type well, you want to trigger it exactly when they're, you know, when they're connected like this, you won't be able to do this because the, as you imagine these things coming together, you get so many extra stray neutrons coming in because of the, the nature of plutonium that you won't be able to form a proper critical mass. It'll just, it won't be able to, to form the critical mass. And so that's why for plutonium, um, if you want to produce a high yield, uh, you can't use a gun type weapon. Um, that's the whole point about predetonation. What you will produce, though, and this is something that I think is not emphasized enough, is um, you, <laughs> you could still produce a yield. It just won't be a large yield. So if you think about non-state actors wanting to produce a gun-type weapon with plutonium, they could do it, but they couldn't produce a, a large yield that would, that would be a concern. But that doesn't mean it's not important from the point of view of how the public re would react to it. So I think even plutonium is a concern from, for a gun-type weapon. Um, I actually have a question about um, your previous talk concerning the disarmament. Um, you mentioned the conference, a conference about um, disarmament. You did some exercise or backstaging or something. I would be interested in what, what were your conclusions in this due, due to this um, or can you give uh, just a little comment, or shall we talk about this? Or? Yeah, I think it's good to have a conversation about this. Oh, it's turned off, okay. Um, so in the Journal of Nuclear Materials Management, we discussed some of the, uh, some of the results. I kind of listed to you the main ones already. Um, because we had a very uh, diverse group of people, right? We had academics, we had people from the national labs, um, we had you know, people from all over. Um, so we, it's, it's sort of, I would say it's the beginning process. In terms of, in terms of conclusions, I think we're just starting this whole 
whole process of really uh, thinking things through. It is clear, though, um, that there will be a difference at different steps. So you need a different verification regime at different uh, mile points when you're talking about 1,000 or 100 or, or 10. I think it's, it's, it's good, even if you don't believe in this, uh, I think it's good to start thinking about what sort of, sort of technology... What I mean is, even if you don't believe it's going to happen today or in our lifetime, it is useful to think about what technology would need to be in place um, uh, now uh, to see whether you could uh, develop it so you know exactly where you're going.